I'm Denise Montel, past president of the GSA, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the last of what has turned out to be a very enjoyable GSA Awards seminar series. Two quick reminders. All GSA online events are governed by a code of conduct, which is available at the link in the chat. If you have questions for the speaker, please enter them into the chat window, and we will get to as many of them as possible after the talk. Today, we're honoring Feng Zhang with the Edward Novitsky Prize for Creativity and Intellectual Ingenuity in the Solution of Significant Problems in Genetics Research. Feng is recognized for his work in developing optogenetics and CRISPR genome editing, incredibly powerful tools that have opened up myriad new research directions across our field and beyond. As a graduate student in Carl Dysroth's lab, he solved many critical problems in the development of optogenetics. For example, he developed a lentiviral gene delivery system that solved issues with expressing channel rhodopsin proteins in neurons. He developed protocols for moving this technology to intact animals, and he identified new channel rhodopsins to enable combinatorial approaches and activation with lower energy photons. Because of this work, optogenetics is now a routine tool in neuroscience, and I'm sure you all saw the work out this week showing the first step toward its use to treat blindness in a human patient. In his own lab, Fung has turned to developing methods for precise genome editing in living organisms. After demonstrating the use of uh, tail proteins to target mammalian loci, his lab was the first to adapt CRISPR-Cas9 to edit mammalian genomes and has continued to play a leading role in improving the fidelity, efficiency, and flexibility of a range of CRISPR-based methods. Whole genome loss of function CRISPR screening was first developed in the Zhang lab and is now in wide use in a range of applications. He has also discovered and applied new CRISPR systems, including Cas12, Cas12A, and also Cas13A, the first CRISPR enzyme targeting RNA. Fung and colleagues have demonstrated that Cas13A can be used for sensitive pathogen detection, including rapid paper strip tests for SARS-CoV-2. Talking um, to this creative output from the Zhang lab seems to have no end. And today he'll be talking about their work on another fascinating phenomenon and ingenious tool, CRISPR associated transposon systems. So on behalf of the board of directors, I'm pleased to virtually present Fung with this year's Novitsky prize. And I hope everyone listening will join me in a little emoji applause. And now I'll hand it over to you, Fung. Thank, thank you, Denise, and thank, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and also thank you uh, to you and also GSA for giving me this uh, award. Uh, it's a tremendous honor, and, and it really um, uh, recognizes um, the work of many um, trainees and collaborators that have worked with me over uh, the past uh, decade to develop um, a number of uh, exciting technologies. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really a great honor to be able to tell you about our continued work on uh, studying microbial systems and also harnessing them for uh, novel biotechnology applications. Um, just to get us uh, started, um, um, something that is uh, already pretty widely used are the CRISPR-based uh, uh, genome editing toolbox. Um, the enzyme CRISPR-Cas9 uh, has now been uh, developed for both uh, genome editing, uh, but also uh, used for uh, targeting of different effector domains uh, using RNA guide to achieve modulation and also other uh, perturbations uh, within, within the genome. So this has um, already become a, a useful tool. And, and what is really exciting is that this toolbox is continuing to be expanded so that our abilities are now, um, our ability to change the genome and study the genome is just becoming uh, more and more uh, flexible. One of the uh, really exciting um, uh, applications of the CRISPR system for uh, genetics and also understanding biological systems is the use uh, as a functional uh, genetic screening tool. Um, because the CRISPR enzyme can be easily guided by a short uh, guide RNA, um, these RNA guides can be synthesized at a very large scale to be able to target uh, many different genes, um, sometimes all of the genes in the genome, or to target a large number of non-coding uh, locations within the genome. And so uh, these kinds of uh, genetic uh, screening methods um, is now uh, enabling very rapid identification of uh, new gene function um, and, uh, and is um, being used uh, in, in a variety of different uh, disease um, uh, studies as well to understand uh, driver mutations or protective mutations 
in cancer and also uh, to be able to understand uh, in other types of regeneration and also um, transplantation uh, applications as well. So to carry out these genetic screens, uh, you can uh, achieve either loss of function uh, or gain of function uh, perturbation. Loss of function is typically uh, achieved through um, uh, cleavage and inactivation of the gene or uh, cleavage-induced mutations of non-coding sequences in the genome. And the gain of function uh, can be achieved by uh, using the, the catalytic inactive Cas9 to bring uh, transcription activation domains to specific sites in the genome to be able to turn genes on. And, and this complementary set of loss of function and gain of function uh, applications are, are also uh, very exciting. And, and we use it in our laboratory uh, to study uh, a number of different um, uh, disease-related processes. So because these RNA-guided um, tools have been um, really useful and powerful, uh, we asked the question, uh, are there additional RNA-guided systems that we can uh, identify, uh, figure out how they work, and then also harness them so that we can use them to expand our ability to study and, and, and also eventually to treat disease? This diagram shows the current classification of CRISPR systems. Um, there's something called a class one CRISPR system, uh, which uses um, a slightly more complicated RNA-guided domain um, so there are multiple proteins that come together to form an effector complex to be able to uh, recognize it and also act on DNA. <clears throat> and then there are the class II CRISPR systems, which use a single protein, um, uh, such as Cas9 or, or Cas12, uh, to be able to recognize uh, DNA and then also modify the DNA. And so the class II systems are simpler, and therefore it's, it's easier to, to manipulate, and we use it to be able to study uh, different, um, and we, we really focus on trying to study uh, these different types of class two uh, CRISPR systems. So nowadays, um, a large number of CRISPR class two systems have been identified. Uh, here is a crystal structure of Cas9, uh, which is uh, the first class two CRISPR systems that, that was studied and also uh, harnessed uh, for biotechnology applications. But then there are many other uh, DNA targeting CRISPR systems. Uh, there's a very diverse family called the Cas12, and there are many different variants, Cas12a, Cas12b, Cas12e, uh, and, and pretty much almost every letter of the alphabet now. And these uh, different Cas12s also target DNA, and they have different properties which are now being used uh, to be able to carry out um, uh, uh, genome editing and also other applications for studying uh, uh, genome function. And then there are the RNA targeting systems. Um, so these are the diverse family of Cas13 uh, enzymes. Uh, they use RNA to guide uh, the recognition of other RNA molecules, and, and it's uh, also a very uh, exciting um, application. I'll, I'll tell you about uh, some of our work uh, harnessing these uh, for, um, uh, for diagnostics applications. <clears throat> so as we continue to develop um, genome editing, uh, one of the, uh, the key challenges that we have been focused on is to achieve um, high efficiency uh, insertion of DNA into the genome. Uh, genome editing works very well for a uh, loss of function uh, to knock things out or to cut uh, DNA sequences out uh, or, or, or small changes uh, using uh, base editing, for example. Uh, but the ability to introduce large DNA sequences remain uh, a, a major challenge. And so we have tried a number of different strategies uh, to be able to insert DNA. Uh, some of our earlier strategies use um, uh, Cas9 proteins or tail proteins to guide transposases uh, these are synthetic constructions of fusion proteins, but we run into a lot of challenges because these transposase proteins have inherent DNA binding uh, affinity. And so what we end up seeing is that not only do we get targeted insertion uh, guided by Cas9 or, or tails, but also you, also, you, you see um, an unguided or, or just uh, insertion mediated by the DNA binding of the transposase proteins themselves. So we have iterated on, on those ideas. And so uh, another idea that we um, um, developed was to use Cas9 uh, to guide the formation of R loops. So these are uh, uh, targeted regions in the genome where the DNA has been unwound and, and a single stranded region of that DNA is exposed. So this allowed us to then use Cas9 to bring a single stranded transposase, uh, such as TMPA, to be able to insert DNA uh, in a precise way. Uh, and and this, this methodology works, but the efficiency is low, and we're continuing to work on 
um, uh, improving the TMPA enzyme so that we can do this at a high efficiency. Uh, so these are just some of the things that we were continuing to, uh, to, to develop uh, the concepts of them. But while we were working on it um, um, and working with our collaborator, Eugene Kunin at NIH, uh, we were looking at CRISPR diversity. And, um, and typically the study of CRISPR diversity have focused on the CRISPR proteins themselves. Uh, so these cast genes, whether it's from class one systems or class two systems. And what, what later was found by Eugene was that in addition to these CRISPR um, associate proteins, if you look farther away in these CRISPR loci, you end up finding that there are other uh, transposase uh, related genes that are evolutionarily linked to these CRISPR genes. And so this is very interesting because um, there, there are several different poss possibilities. Transposases of the TN7 variety um, or, or TN7 like a variety um, often carry cargo genes. And these cargo genes um, are sometimes involved in providing defense function for bacteria. And given that CRISPR systems are another defense system, um, it's, 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 it's um, known in some cases that uh, these TN7-like transposons can carry CRISPR systems because they, they are uh, like any other uh, uh, cargo gene, they're, they're part of the TN7 transposon cargo. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, what was found is that the CRISPR system, whether it's class one or class two, uh, they don't have the catalytic domain um, active in those systems. So that means if they are able to uh, target uh, DNA, they don't cleave DNA, which means they actually cannot carry out the defense function uh, that, um, that they normally carry out. And so then a, hypo a hypothesis um, was established where um, we hypothesize maybe um, these transposases uh, use the DNA targeting capability of the CRISPR systems, whether it's class one or class two CRISPR system to direct the transposition targeting. And, and so we thought this would be a really cool mechanism if it really worked that way. And so we decided to see um, how, do, how do we go about testing it? We focus our study on the class two associated uh, trans, uh, uh, transposase systems because the class two enzymes are simpler, uh, but, but both of these um, uh, would presumably function in a similar way. <clears throat> we begin uh, by looking at a cyanobacteria called Cytonema hoffmanni. Uh, this is a cyanobacteria that carries one of the um, TN7 uh, associated transposase uh, systems. And this is um, uh, the, the CRISPR locus or, or the transpo transposon locus that you see in the cyanobacteria. Here you see uh, genes that are related to the TN7-like uh, uh, transposon. There are TNSB, TNSC, and also TNIQ. And then on the right, uh, right end of the transposon, you find a Cas12K protein along with uh, the, the RNA uh, elements, the CRISPR array. If you carry out, uh, and, and also by the way, in the middle uh, are cargo genes. Uh, and this cargo uh, section can be quite long. It can be almost 20 kilobases. Uh, and sometimes even larger, 50 kilobases or even up to 100 kilobases for some um, um, uh, transposons. If you perform RNA-seq, uh, you will see that uh, the RNA uh, elements um, associated with the Cas12K enzyme are expressed. So there is a tracer RNA um, as well as uh, the CRISPR array, which is expressed and matured into the individual uh, CRISPR RNAs uh, to, to guide a Cas12K, presumably. So we wanted to see, um, is this Cas12K system really interacting with the TN7-like uh, transposase genes? And are they working together to perform uh, RNA-guided uh, transposition? We designed an experiment uh, to, to test this. And this experiment um, uh, consists of uh, three different uh, pieces of uh, plasmids. Uh, the first plasmid is the donor plasmid. It's got a transposon that have the two uh, transposon ends uh, flanking a uh, candomycin resistance gene. And then we also have a target plasmid that carries uh, a sequence that matches uh, the spacer uh, or the, the guide sequence that was, that's encoded in the CRISPR array uh, for the Cas12K system, but also right next to it, a randomized sequence uh, that we can use to figure out, uh, is there a PAM sequence uh, that the Cas12K enzyme uses? PAM is a specific motif that CRISPR proteins use to be able to initially latch onto DNA 
Um, and, and different CRISPR proteins have different PAM sequences. And that's why we have a randomized region so that we can uh, identify what, what that uh, active um, PAM sequence is for this particular protein. The third plasmid carries the TN7 associated uh, transposase uh, genes. And so these are the TNSB, TNSC, and also TNIQ. Uh, but also uh, we put the CRISPR system on, on the same plasmid, Cas12K, the trace RNA, and also a reprogrammed uh, CRISPR array where the, the guide sequence matches the target set. The idea is that if we put all three of these plasmids into a bacterial cell, <coughs> these enzymes will get expressed. Uh, and also the, in, the transposase enzymes will work with the Cas12K enzyme uh, and also the RNA to then guide the transposition or the insertion of this transposon into the target plasmid. And so we did this experiment. We transformed the E. coli with all these plasmids, and then we extracted the plasmid and sequenced them to see, do we have this transposon inserted uh, into where um, that target site is? It turned out that um, this experiment worked. Uh, this was really exciting uh, because we first found that there is a specific um, PAM sequence. Um, it's a simple motif. It's a GT with a slight preference for, for a T in the third position. And also the insertions uh, happened uh, approximately 60 bases downstream of the start of the, of the recognition site. Uh, there's a little bit of a wiggle room for the insertion, but, but largely uh, it's precisely in the spot. And this is a very characteristic of, of, of TN7-like uh, transposons. And so this experiment told us that this indeed is an RNA-guided uh, transposing system. And so we were really excited to continue uh, to, to characterize how the system uh, works. One of the things we tested was to see, um, can this efficiently uh, transpose uh, a varying length of transpose, uh, transposons? So we began with uh, half a KB and then went up to uh, 10 kilobases. And we found that um, without any selection uh, for the insertion event, uh, we can get um, pretty high levels of insertion, 50% uh, uh, for uh, short transposons and then 25% for, for large uh, transposons. And so this is um, really cool because uh, this means that enzyme is a, is a pretty active system. And then we biochemically uh, extracted uh, the proteins and also uh, the RNA, and, and we, saw, we saw that we were able to reconstitute um, the, the enzyme uh, activity uh, in vitro. And so here is uh, using the cast proteins, the, the guide RNA and the trace RNA, and we can uh, detect insertion events uh, by PCR. And also uh, you can fuse the CRISPR RNA and the trace RNA together to form a single guide RNA. Uh, like we do with Cas9, uh, and you can also achieve uh, uh, RNA-guided insertion. We then also um, tested to see, can the system mediate um, reprogrammed insertion uh, at a um, you know, reasonable, uh, reasonably large number of uh, different spots in the genome? And we found that indeed, uh, this system uh, works pretty well. Uh, these are different guide RNAs, 5, 9, 10, 15, and so forth. And we tested, um, reprogram insertion into the E. coli genome. And you can see that uh, many of the guys can, can get pretty good levels of insertion. Um, of course, there, there's variability in the guide efficacy. And so some of the guys are, are less effective, but overall uh, we can uh, reliably achieve uh, RNA guided uh, transposition uh, in, in, in the cells. And so, so we're um, really excited about this, this mechanism and we're continuing to work on uh, understanding this mechanism and also uh, trying to um, to harness it so that we can use it as, as a gene insertion tool, uh, even in uh, eukaryotic cells. While we were working on this, uh, one of the uh, things that we were really curious about was how do these uh, transposons get into where they are in the genome of bacteria in the first place? Because if we examine uh, these different uh, transposons, uh, these are various um, uh, CRISPR-associated transposase systems. And if we examine the CRISPR guide RNAs that are encoded by each one of these transposons, we rarely ever see um, the transposon, um, we, we rarely ever see the target site um, uh, matching what the guide RNAs are in the CRISPR array. And so if these transposons target and insert themselves into genomes um, through a CRISPR guided mechanism, why is it that we don't see uh, matches between the CRISPR 
um, uh, guide sequences and also the target site that we find them in. Instead, uh, we find that the target sites correspond to uh, tRNAs and, and other uh, specific uh, genes in the bacterial genome. So this made us uh, sort of wonder um, what, where we naturally find these transposons, we call them the homing site of the transposase. And then um, where the CRISPR systems direct them um, is where we call the target site uh, on the mobile uh, elements that, that the transposons hop onto. So how is homing uh, achieved uh, by these different CRISPR associated transposases if the homing uh, site is not recognized or, or programmed by their guide RNA? <clears throat> it turned out that uh, they are um, homed uh, by the guide RNA, except the homing uh, RNA guide is not encoded in the CRISPR array. Instead, it's encoded uh, by a small cryptic element uh, that's next to the CRISPR array, but you wouldn't detect it because um, the, um, the repeat sequence that, that, that defines the CRISPR array has been mutated uh, so that it's, it's only a very short uh, sequence um, that's, that's quite short. Um, uh, so you can see this is what a CRISPR array repeat looks like. So this is about 36 base pairs long. And then the, the, de the delocalized or the cryptic uh, guide RNA uh, has a very short, um, just a 12 to 15 uh, tip, uh, base, basis long uh, for, for the direct repeat. But nevertheless, the spacer that's, in, uh, that's uh, adjacent to this cryptic or delocalized de repeat uh, consistently matches the target site uh, downstream of the transposome. And so for the 5K uh, CRISPR system, uh, we found that uh, indeed it has this RNA guided homing mechanism. Uh, it's just that the, the guide RNA that homes the transposon is, uh, is, is cryptic, it's hard to detect. Uh, but, but this provides, uh, this, this answered a question about how, how this system is able to home uh, to, to their natural uh, target sites. But what happens for other types of CAS systems? And so this, um, diagram here shows a different type of um, CAS system. These are the type 1B uh, CAS systems. They're type 1B because uh, they use the CRISPR type 1 uh, RNA guided DNA uh, targeting domains, uh, which have multiple proteins that together form uh, the RNA complex. And there are two different types of type 1B system. There's the, the type uh, subtype 1, uh, where you have the TNS A, B, C, and also TNIQ and TNS G, uh, D genes. And then you also have the subtype two, where um, the transposase genes, uh, TNS A and B, are fused together naturally uh, as a single uh, protein. And so, so for both of these two different subtypes, one thing that is really peculiar um, is that um, uh, the CRISPR array also uh, don't encode uh, the, uh, the homing sequence uh, for, for where their natural uh, locations are. And also we tried to see, are there cryptic uh, spacers uh, next to these CRISPR arrays, and we didn't find any cryptic spacers. So, uh, so this 1B system likely follows a different mechanism of homing uh, compared to, um, uh, to the 5K uh, system. So then we examine uh, these loci a little bit more. And what we found that was really interesting is that it carries two of these adapter proteins, uh, TNIQ and also TNSD. Um, here's TNIQ and also TNSD. And so, for the normal TN7-like transposases, uh, they use TNSD uh, to, to home uh, to their target site. And so we wondered maybe the fact that there are two different uh, adapter proteins, um, uh, one of them is involved in adapting the TN7 transposases to the CRISPR system, and then the other one is, uh, is responsible for adapting to, to the homing site, uh, so that uh, instead of using an RNA-guided homing mechanism, uh, this 1B system has a uh, protein-guided uh, homing mechanism. And so indeed, uh, that, that is true. Um, so if you look at these uh, systems, uh, what, what, what we found is that uh, for the type 1B systems, it has two uh, sort of adapter proteins. They are largely conserved um, on the N-terminus, but then the C-terminus is, is where uh, it varies uh, quite a bit. And, uh, and so um, based, on, based on this, we, we then... Um, did an experiment where we knocked out one or the other, and we found that uh, one of them is responsible for, um, for homing, uh, and then the other one is responsible for um, uh, working with the CRISPR system to achieve RNA-guided uh, transposition. 
And so, so by studying both the type 5K and also the type 1B CRISPR system, we found that there are two ways that these CRISPR um, uh, uh, associated transposases can transpose uh, to their homing, uh, home, home site. And so one of the mechanisms uh, is, is, is using uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, TNSD to, to achieve homing. And then the other one is you use these um, cryptic RNA guides uh, to, to achieve homing. Um, so this further, um, uh, I guess, highlight the diversity of, of systems out in nature. And, uh, and so we thought this is, this is a really a cool system. And so uh, whether they're using uh, DNA uh, protein or using RNA to home uh, to their uh, target site, uh, they both also use uh, CRISPR RNA guided transposition to be able to jump onto mobile genetic elements uh, to be able to uh, spread themselves um, um, uh, further. So those are some of the work that we have done on the CRISPR associated transposases, but we're also uh, continuing to, uh, to work on uh, developing the other uh, CRISPR uh, systems that we have been discovering. So um, earlier I told you about all these different CRISPR diversity that you find in nature. And, uh, and so in addition to working with these DNA targeting systems, we've also been uh, engineering uh, the RNA targeting systems uh, in particular uh, for diagnostics uh, applications. And so the RNA systems are, are also quite interesting. Um, they are also expressed and, and quite robustly um, uh, represented in the bacterial diversity. And if you just do RNA-seq, you see that uh, these RNA systems are, are also um, expressed in, in four mature CRISPR RNAs. But there's a one interesting um, uh, difference uh, about the way that Cas13 uh, goes about recognizing and cleaving uh, its RNA target. And this is what we call uh, a collateral uh, RNA's activity. The way this works is um, if you consider this experiment where we have a guide RNA and we have a piece of RNA that is not targeted uh, by the guide RNA. If you add in uh, the CRISPR-Cas13 protein, um, as you would predict, um, this non-targeted RNA remains intact uh, because it's not recognized by the CRISPR RNA and so the enzyme doesn't doesn't recognize it, doesn't activate to cleave it. But let's add a twist to this experiment. So here we have the target RNA and also a guide RNA that indeed recognizes this target. But in the same reaction, we'll also put in um, a non-targeted RNA. And then if you add in um, the Cas13 protein, uh, what you find is that not only is the target RNA cleaved, these non-targeted RNA, these collateral RNAs are also cleaved by the enzyme. And so this is very interesting because if you did this experiment with Cas9, where you have a target DNA and also a non-target DNA, only the target DNA will be cleaved and the non-target DNA will remain intact. But Cas13 seems to have a different mechanism. It cleaves the target DNA, but it also cleaves other DNA. So this suggests that the recognition of the target RNA uh, sorry, uh, I mean RNA. So, so the recognition of target RNA activates Cas13 so that it continues uh, and, and can and, and go and cleave other RNA molecules within the same reaction. So it's this um, uh, collateral activity that we then have been developing uh, to, to develop uh, a, a easy and also sensitive uh, diagnostics test. And so uh, before COVID-19, we were developing applications of this for detecting uh, Ebola viruses or Zika viruses. But then with the, the emergence of uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, we've also began to, to focus our effort on developing uh, diagnostics for, for COVID-19. So this is um, how, <clears throat> how the cas based diagnostics application works. So um, there are two steps. Um, the first step is the amplification reaction where we um, take either DNA or RNA input, and then we use RPA, which is an isothermal amplification method, followed by T7 transcription to generate um, amplified RNA of the input uh, genetic signature. After amplification, we then carry out CRISPR-based detection, where we have um, the CRISPR protein, uh, the guide RNA that's been uh, designed to recognize the pathogen that we're trying to detect, but we also put in a collateral RNA, but this, these collateral RNAs are reported RNAs that we modified by attaching two different uh, small molecules uh, to, to, to the two different ends. The idea here is that if the 
the target RNA, the, the pathogen is present, Cas13 will recognize it and then cleave it, but also the collateral activity that's get, that gets activated uh, will also cleave these reporter molecules. So if you run these reporter molecules out on a paper strip, uh, this, is, uh, this is a lateral flow strip where there are two lines, one that captures biotin and the other one uh, captures the other molecule, uh, which in this case is, is a FAM a molecule. And so if the pathogen is present, when you flow this on a paper strip, you see two lines because the reporter has been separated. Um, and if the pathogen is not present, when you flow this, you only see one line because the pathogen uh, is not present. And, and so the reporter is not cleaved and everything will get bound by, by the first line. And so this provides a very simple visual-based readout where you can see whether or not um, the, the, the pathogen is present in the sample. And this is just uh, some early paper strips showing detection of Zika uh, RNA uh, signature. And you can see that uh, when the sample is detected um, up to a, uh, a uh, limit of detection, you can see the development of, this, of the second line. Whereas um, if it's below the limit of detection uh, over here, this is, uh, this is one uh, sort of a, a sort of one molecule per microliter sensitivity. Uh, here, we, 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 don't, we don't detect it and you don't see the development of this uh, uh, detection line. And so this provides a, a nice way to be able to uh, see whether or not we can detect uh, using, using this assay. Uh, another thing that, that we were able to do is to develop uh, the ability to multiplex uh, the detection. And this, is, this has to do with how Cas13 recognizes and also cleaves the target uh, RNA. So here, um, this is a single-stranded RNA target. And so we designed guide RNAs that cover um, many, many different places along this RNA. So these are different guide RNAs that recognize different sections of this uh, target RNA. Um, when we ran um, the, cleavage, the cleavage product on gel, what we found is that irrespective of where that RNA targets on the target RNA, uh, you get the same cleavage pattern. And this is very different than what you would see with Cas9 or, or Cas12, because with Cas9, wherever you recognize is where the cleavage site uh, happens. And so you would get different cleavage pa patterns if you have different uh, target sites. But with Cas13, it seems that it's not cleaving at the target site. Um, and, and it's most likely that it's cleaving either specific secondary structures that you find in the RNA uh, or cleaving uh, specific uh, motifs uh, in, in the target RNA. So this led us to, to then uh, try to characterize this a little bit more. And so by doing RNA sequencing, we found that the cleavage site is near where uracil uh, molecules are, or red residues are within the RNA. And, then, and so if you mutate these individual uracil uh, residues, you can get rid of specific um, uh, cleavage uh, sites. And so this uh, allowed us to confirm that indeed Cas13 uh, cleaves in a sequence uh, dependent way. <clears throat> so then we hypothesize maybe because there are so many different Cas13 orthologs out there, different Cas13s will have um, different recognition um, uh, ability. Uh, so they cleave different sequences. And so we carried out a screen where we have reporters that have different sequences um, uh, encoded and we screen a large number of different Cas13 uh, orthologs proteins and, and we found that Indeed, uh, different Cas13s uh, cleave different uh, dinucleotides. And so this allowed us to identify uh, Cas13 orthologs that have um, different cleavage preferences. And this also allowed us to then develop a multiplex um, assay where we can mix uh, different Cas13 orthologs proteins together along with uh, different guys and also different reporters uh, to be able to detect uh, more than one uh, molecule, uh, more than one target signature within the reaction, and so what we found is is, is the following: um, if you have a sample that doesn't have any of the three different signatures we're trying to detect, you don't get any signal. And if you have one out of three, you can very reliably detect individually. And then you have two out of three, you can detect just the two uh, signatures. And then we have all three, uh, you can detect all three at once. And so these are all uh, tests that are done uh, using a single reaction uh, where the three different orthologs proteins and a guide RNA and reporters are mixed together into a single tube. And so this, this is very, very nice because 
it means that if we're trying to detect uh, multiple different things, for example, if you want to see uh, whether a person has uh, SARS-CoV-2 or influenza, uh, you can do it uh, within a uh, you, you can develop a single test uh, to be able to do that. So when when the COVID-19 um, emerged uh, in the early part of 2020, um, I, I became very alarmed by this and, and began to uh, develop um, our Sherlock-based uh, detection assay for detecting SARS-CoV-2. And so we, um, we uh, developed a, a number of different reagents and protocols and, and worked with collaborators uh, to test whether or not there is, um, uh, if the test works well for, for detecting uh, the virus signature. And so working with uh, Keith Jerome and also Alex Greninger at the University of Washington, uh, they, they applied the COVID-19 uh, Sherlock test uh, on, on uh, nasal pharyngeal samples from uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients. And what they found is that the paper strip based test works pretty well. And, uh, and it has uh, good concordance with qPCR based uh, assays. And so, so you can uh, very reliably detect um, uh, when the qPCR uh, samples are, are positive. We also um, uh, worked with another collaborator in Thailand, uh, Tao, uh, and, uh, and he uh, was working in a hospital and he also, he was also uh, testing the Sherlock protocol on, the, on, on the patient samples. And he found that uh, there can be a pretty good sensitivity, 93%, and then also 100% um, specificity for the test. And so based on, on this, uh, he was able to uh, get approval uh, from the Thai government uh, to then uh, use this as a way to triage uh, patients who are coming in uh, for, for uh, different um, uh, examinations in, in his hospital. <clears throat> and then a, a company that I helped to co-found called Sherlock Biosciences, uh, received um, FDA's uh, EUA uh, permission uh, to, to use uh, Sherlock uh, as a uh, uh, clinical test for, for testing COVID-19. So as, as all those uh, collaborations were going on, um, uh, we continue to work on uh, further improving uh, the, the test. So the Sherlock test is a two-step test. Uh, you run amplification first, and then you run detection second. Um, that Two-step nature makes the test uh, more cumbersome to run, and also it increases the chance for environmental contamination because after, after amplification, you have to open up the tube and an aerosol can come out and, and contaminate uh, the, the work area. And so we thought it would be nice if we can develop a single uh, step test by merging uh, the amplification and also detection uh, into a single reaction. And so we eventually developed what we call stop COVID V2, uh, which uh, works as follows. Um, you, you take a swab and you dip the swab into a lysis buffer, but the lysis buffer carries magnetic beads that can bind to the virus RNA. And by placing uh, this mixture onto a magnet, you can pull down the RNA onto the magnetic beads and then you can remove the extraction buffer. So now by adding in a single mixture um, of the stop COVID V2 reagent, you can then um, uh, release the RNA from these uh, magnetic beads. And then the mixture carries both a lamb-based amplification uh, mixture as well as uh, CRISPR-based detection to then be able to uh, amplify and also uh, recognize and, and uh, cleave the reporter uh, at the same time. So you incubate this mixture at 60 degrees for somewhere between um, uh, 30 minutes to, to an hour. And then, uh, and then you can get uh, a readout on either a paper strip-based test uh, or a fluorescence-based assay. So, um, <clears throat> so, so to, to develop this, uh, the first thing we had to do is to identify a thermostable uh, Cas uh, protein. And so for this, we turn to Cas12b uh, because um, Cas12b are often found in, in thermophiles. And so we were able to find uh, a, a specific one called AAP uh, Cas12b uh, that works uh, reliably even at elevated temperatures. And being able to be stable at elevated temperatures, it means that we can combine this with a lamb-based reaction, which you have to incubate at 60 uh, to 68 uh, degrees. <coughs> and when we uh, uh, combined lamb and, and also uh, the AAP capsule B together, we found that uh, this stop COVID-based reaction um, is, is much more uh, uh, reliable uh, so no, no false positive compared to lamp reaction alone. And so on the left side, what you see is the lamp reaction. And, and what happens is if you run lamp for long enough, uh, you will eventually start to get false positive signals. 
And so even with the no, tar uh, no target control, the NTC, no input, uh, you still see signal if you run the reaction for long enough. And if you run LAMP together with, uh, uh, with a CRISPR-based detection, we eliminate those false positive signals. So you only see the real positives. And so this is a, 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 um, a significant improvement to the ability to be able to have accurate uh, detection. And so we uh, developed uh, stop COVID over two iterations. The first iteration did not have the magnetic bead based capturing. And what we found is that with this, uh, our limited detection was the equivalent of a qPCR value of 30.8. And, and this, this is a okay value, but it means that um, we wouldn't be able to detect the virus in people who have low virus uh, titer. And so then we developed the V2 uh, of the test where we uh, combined uh, the V1 reaction uh, with um, the magnetic bead based uh, pull down of the virus RNA. And, and now we we're able to then achieve a limit, limited detection of 40.3. And so this is on par with where people set uh, as a cutoff uh, for, for qPCR based assays. And so this, um, this plot gives you a sense of the distribution. This is uh, more than a thousand different uh, COVID-19 patient samples uh, and, and their qPCR value. So you can see that uh, they really distribute uh, from you know, people who have very high virus load, they have low CT value, around 15. And then there are um, people who can have low virus uh, load almost to the detection threshold, uh, which is CT value 40. So with a CT value, uh, with a limited detection that's equivalent to CT of 30, then we can have about 60% uh, sensitivity. Whereas if, with, if we use a magnetic bead-based uh, uh, pull down uh, to, to concentrate the samples, we can then achieve uh, almost 100% sensitivity uh, because we can go all the way up to where the qPCR cutoff is. And so this is um, testing of, of the stop covid B2 uh, on um, 202 uh, positive patient samples and 200 negative patient samples. And what we found is that uh, the sensitivity now is, is pretty good. It's 93% sensit sensitive and also is uh, 98.5% uh, specific. So, so this provides a, a, uh, a, a, a test that is, that is uh, uh, comparable to what uh, people uh, may be using clinically. So, so those are um, some of the applications that, that we're developing. But uh, one thing that we're continuing to, to be excited about is to further explore the natural diversity. If you think about um, the things that I talked about, Cas9, Cas12, Cas13, CRISPR associated CRISPR transposases, there are all systems that came out of the, the natural uh, bacterial diversity. And so as people sequence more and more bacterial diversity, uh, we are now accumulating um, a lot of uh, genomic data and metagenomic data. And so we're continuing to, uh, to use our uh, computation approaches uh, to be able to uh, uh, look through uh, these data to try to discover a novel uh, biology and, and novel systems. And so this is just one, um, one, one study that we published um, recently where we applied this um, uh, computational mining uh, strategy to identify um, uh, different systems that have to do with uh, defense or immunity function in bacteria. Um, um, and so, so this, this uh, were, were able to allow us to find um, a number of interesting uh, candidate systems and, and we're uh, studying uh, some of these systems to see are there interesting molecular mechanisms that we may be able to, um, to, to, to study and also the harness to develop uh, even more powerful uh, biotechnology tools. So, so, so that's all I have uh, for today. But uh, last but not least, this is the most important slide because I, I really want to uh, acknowledge not only our, our, um, uh, the, the lab members, the graduate students and postdocs who, who, uh, to, who share these passion, uh, who have been working with me uh, for, for more than a decade now to study and develop these technologies, but also uh, a number of collaborators who have worked with um, also, also for, for a decade and longer now uh, on, uh, on studying and also applying uh, these technologies. And then um, none of the work would have been possible uh, without funding from, from um, uh, both uh, funding agencies and also philanthropic organizations. Uh, and, and, uh, and also our work, we're always uh, recruiting um, uh, uh, lab members who, uh, or, or new lab members. So, so if you have an interest in, in studying 
um, uh, biodiversity um, and, and also in developing uh, new technologies, feel free to uh, send me an email. Um, and last but not least, I, I want to um, uh, thank the GSA and, and also the organizers again uh, for this great honor and also for the opportunity uh, to share some of our work. Um, thank you again, and uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Fung, for that remarkable uh, seminar. Uh, the diversity of things that you're discovering is just so amazing. Um, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat and uh, or you can use the raise hand function. And I um, would just like to, I'm just trying to check if anyone has a raised hand, okay. Um, and then maybe I could just kick off the questions. I see, okay, we have at least one raised hand. So um, let me just ask you what you see as the most exciting application, either you know, basic research or a clinical application of the transposon system. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that question. I, I think there are a lot of um, um, really uh, cool applications. So um, the ability to be able to insert uh, large uh, DNA cargo uh, in, into the genome allows us to do uh, either gene replacement uh, or to develop more generalized therapies uh, for genetic diseases. If you think about genetic disorders, um, sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, um, they, if, uh, patients can have different mutations affecting the same gene. And so if we were to take a precision gene correction approach, uh, what that means is that you have to develop different uh, drugs, different composition of, of gene editing uh, molecules for different mutations. And from a, from a development perspective, it can be challenging. And also from a, a safety perspective, you have to do a lot of um, very deep characterization for each reagent just to be able to uh, treat um, different patients uh, from the same uh, disease uh, type. Uh, being able to insert uh, larger fragments, you can imagine replacing whole exons where there can be um, many different uh, disease-causing mutations um, without having to develop individual uh, therapies. And, uh, and so, so I think that is one advantage. Um, I, think, I think the application is not limited to, to therapeutics either. Um, for, uh, for synthetic biology or for plant biology, um, this provides a nice way to be able to uh, perform genetic engineering of larger um, uh, genomic structures um, with ease. Um, for plants, uh, you can imagine combining many, many different traits together into a single transposon that you then uh, insert into the genome. And, and that can significantly reduce um, the, the time that, that's required for, for crossing and breeding. Uh, and you can also have uh, more, more, um, more, um, reliable and, and, and robust uh, genetic uh, traits. Great, thank you. Let's, I wanna move to some of the uh, other questions here. Uh, Tom Klein has his hand up. Tom, do you wanna? Do you wanna, are you muted, Tom? Yeah, I'm also, I was also, I was also frozen. <laughs> that was the problem. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very interesting thing. I really enjoyed that. Um, my question is whether the CAS system um, is the advantage, what is the advantage over alternatives? Is it more efficient delivering large cargoes than alternatives? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think there are, there are no alternatives to the CAS system right now for programmably inserting very large payloads. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you um, think about other transposable systems, um, they are not programmable. So uh, they can efficiently uh, recombine or insert DNA in a, in a specific sequence in the genome at their landing site, but you cannot customize them to go to other places in the, in the genome. Uh, the benefit of CAS is you can give it a, a new guide RNA to retarget it uh, to a new spot. Um, but just the basic idea of targeting a cut and then using, you know, the insertion of DNA you put in there, that can go anywhere. I'm just wondering, is, is it more efficient to actually bring it in right. with the transposon? Right, so, so the transposon would not, um, yeah, so, so, so the transposon would not rely on homologous recombination uh, yeah. or other recombination machineries to be able to insert DNA. 
so, so that the efficiency would be much higher uh, than the HR-based method. Great, thanks. Yeah. Hmm. Great, we have a, a question here from uh, David Obrachta. Can you speculate on the potential of CAST, uh, the transposon systems as general tools and what will it take? Is the TN7 system functional in eukaryotes? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so that, that's the question that we're working on right now. Uh, so we, we definitely want to develop CAST uh, as, a, uh, as a tool, not only for prokaryotic cells, but also for eukaryotic cells to be able to programmably insert DNA. Um, I think there, are, there there's still more work that we we'll have to do uh, to uh, to you know engineer the system so that they can function well in eukaryotic cells. Um, it's it's a more complicated system than Cas9 or Cas12 because there's um, you know a, a complex of many different proteins and also the donor DNA involved. So uh, one of the challenges that that we are working on is to make sure that they can all come together efficiently uh, in the nucleus of the cell. Um, rather, so do you have to cross another membrane and also making sure that all these different proteins uh, are, are localized and able to function. And so that's something that we'll continue to work on, but, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to, to get a system to, to a level that it will be robust and, and, uh, and uh, widely useful. And from Marlies van Borgel, uh, thanks for the talk. Do you think the cargo genes between the transposon and CRISPR elements have a function? And if so, what could that be? That's a really interesting question. And, and we are, we're looking at uh, some of the cargo genes and trying to see if we can um, perform a census of what are all the different functions they encode. So the, uh, the cargo genes uh, can take many different forms and many of them are often involved in uh, defense function. So for example, on the very last slide that I showed um, where we were computationally mining uh, genes for defense function, we actually find that uh, many of them are uh, found as cargos within TN7-like transposons. Um, but of course there are, there are gonna be other genes, but I think many of them will, um, will have the characteristic that they are somehow useful for the bacteria. Um, because if they're useful, then it gives the bacteria a reason to keep that transposon uh, in the genome, because otherwise it, it can get uh, removed. Um, and so, so I think um, that that is uh, something that's very cool. Okay, from Avinash Bandara, it's so great to see people, presumably from all over the world, participating today. Um, thank you very much for the work uh, you do, Dr. Uh, Fung. And since the uh, TNSB protein can cleave the three prime end, will the lack of the five prime cleaving protein like TNSA affect gene integration? That's a really, um, that's a really insightful question. Um, so there are different types of uh, TN7-like transposons. Some of them have TNSA, which is involved in cleaving, um, uh, in, in a, it's a nucleus involved in cleaving the, the three prime end. And then, uh, and then some don't have it. And so uh, there are different types of CRISPR associated transposases as well. Some of them have TNSA, some of them don't. Um, the type 5K associated system don't have TNSA. And so in that case, um, um, it's mediating transpositions through a replicative transposition mechanism. And so um, as, as a way to uh, overcome the lack of TNSA, uh, we have been able to provide pre-nicked or pre-cleaved DNA so that you can still achieve cut and paste uh, insert, uh, transposition uh, because we, we, we pre-process the donor. Uh, the type 1B and also the type uh, uh, 1F system that, uh, that Sam Sternberg and Joe Peters have uh, worked on um, target um, uh, DNA and al also have a TNSA. So they have a cut and paste uh, transposition mechanism. So there's a lot of diversity and, uh, and, and I think it's really, really, really fascinating to, to study all of them. Great. From Meda Agahoseni, uh, thank you for the talk. Is there any possibility to have a multiplex detection for the stop COVID uh, version two assay? And if yes, does the multiplex assay reduce the um, the LOD? That's a. I think that 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 is a really good um, application to develop. Uh, we ha we haven't gotten there yet. Um, I think um, in order to detect, uh, in order to have multiplexing, we we need we need to find a second thermostable Cas12. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think we can find it. Um, we, would, we would have to um, do some metagenomic or, or biodiversity mining uh, to find something that 
has a different sequence cleavage preference, uh, like I've, I've shown uh, with CAS13, um, uh, to, to be able to in enable a new channel. And we may be able to find more than one. So in that case, you can have many different channels. Uh, it's also uh, possible to maybe develop uh, CAS13 uh, for multiplexing. There are also thermal stable CAS13s uh, that are in the biodiversity. And, uh, and also, we would have to find a RNA polymerase to replace T7 polymerase um, that is thermal stable. But, but I think these are all things that, that, we, that we, we, can, we can solve. Uh, in terms of limit detection, um, I think we have to see. Uh, it's possible it may reduce the sensitivity by twofold or, or threefold, depending on however many channels you are multiplexing. Uh, but I think uh, that is something that, that needs to be experimentally uh, confirmed. Now, you're not going to run out of things to do anytime soon. Right. Um, Sylvia Chung asks, uh, thanks for the talk for the protein guide insertions. Oops, I just lost it. There we go. For the protein guided insertions, how do they avoid reinserting back to the homing site? That's a, that's a really interesting question. And, uh, and Nancy Craig and, and others who, have, who are really experts on TN7 have actually done a lot to, to understand that, that self-targeting mechanism. Uh, so it turned out that um, there are protection mechanisms uh, where the TN7 proteins will come back and, and bind uh, to those sites to prevent a uh, reinsertion. And so that, that's one of the ways that the system um, prevents uh, sort of having many, many tandem transposons getting inserted over and over again right next to each other. Uh, but there, there may be diversity in that mechanism too, uh, because there are other systems that have not been characterized and they may have other ways to, to, uh, to prevent self uh, reinsertion. Yeah, just another great example of how that fundamental basic research on transposons and bacteria comes and informs our mm -hmm. very critical clinical needs eventually. Um, Regina Sepsiova asks, have you observed multiple insertions of the same gene um, or insert in your experiments upon permanent expression of, CAS, of the CAST-T system? This question is related to the previous uh, question. Uh, so I, I think um, we, we haven't um, done permanent expression for a long time. Uh, so so I, I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but, um, but, but, but there is prevention of, of reinsertion, um, but over a long period of time, there may be, I, I don't know. I think we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to do the experiment to, to know. Um. Don't see more. Let me just look for raised hands. Um, circling back to to my question, you you were mentioning how the transposon insertion, the targeted transposon insertion, was going to really enable, let's say, replacing a gene or replacing. Um, but what? How does the transposon insertion replace the gene? It seems like it would be an addition to, not a replacement of. Right. Um, that, that's right. So uh, I think one, one way you might do it is, is to insert, uh, so, so say you have uh, exon three of the gene that, that has a mutation. What you can do is you can insert right before exon three um, a uh, intact copy of the remainder of that gene. So that when you get spliced, exon one, two, three, uh, one, two, and the replacement three gets spliced to form the correct gene product. And then the mutated exon three and the subsequent um, section of the gene uh, is still in the genome, but, but they wouldn't be contributing to, to protein production. Got it. One more question from David uh, Kabak. Um, have you tried the ultra-sensitive SARS-CoV-2 uh, test to air samples? Uh, we haven't tried uh, that, but that's a really good idea. Um, I think you probably have to do some concentration of the virus. So maybe with an air filter and they mm -hmm. run it for a few minutes just to, or an hour to concentrate the air, um, the, the virus particles in the air uh, into a smaller volume. Um, uh, I think that's a really, really interesting thing to try. Maybe just test the air filters that we're using anyway. <laughs> right, <laughs> the filters right. in the building, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, for surveillance, I think that that's a really, that, that would be a really good application. Great. Will, okay, one more question. Uh, will the concentration of magnesium and ATP in eukaryotic cells affect CAS transposon mediated integration? Um, it's possible. Um, I think 
I think when, when, uh, what, I, what I realized when studying these bacterial systems is that the systems are all different. Um, if we find, uh, if we're talking about cast system, uh, there are many, many different types of cast systems from many different bacterial uh, species. And depending on where they're, they originally evolved, uh, they could have different properties. So some cast systems may require higher levels of free magnesium than you find in human cells. Uh, others may uh, require less um, than what you find in human cells. And so one of the things that uh, we do when we are trying to understand a system is, is we, we don't just study one system. We, we always sample, uh, we, we, we perform a phylogenetic reconstruction uh, of the system and we see what are all the major evolutionary branches of the system. And then we, um, we, we try to sample from each of the evolutionary branches so that we can, um, we can have a more holistic understanding of the, of the range of activities uh, that's represented by a given mechanism. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us um, at the GSA Award Series. Um, and we're at the hour now, so we're gonna have to go. But uh, and you can see in the chat, from GSA, you know, uh, make sure to register for our upcoming series, Exploring Gene Function Across Humans and Model Organisms. This is going to be a great series of webinars um, that Hugo Bellin is organizing to help us understand how we can take our model organism work and um, communicate with the people who are working on human diseases. Um, and so thanks so much, uh, Fung, for that really fabulous uh, seminar and question Q&A. Thanks everybody Thank for coming. Thank you.